actually, I should probably go ahead and start opening up for, for questions here. And I, you know, as long as anybody has intelligent questions, I'll keep answering them here. So we've got microphone right up front if you want to make a line. Um, uh, first off, again, uh, thanks a lot for releasing all this code. I think id Software has done more than just about any other game developer to help democratize game development through releasing the editing tools, the source code, modules. It's really helped a lot. Um, but hearing you talk about how, you know, Rage is terabytes of data, 192 gigs to go through and pre-bake yeah. everything. Everything for uh, focusing on the needs and, of a professional developer and a professional team, it makes me long back for id Tech 4 where at any moment we could pop into the editor, go through, make a couple tweaks, pop back in, and in a couple minutes we were back in the level yeah. with our changes. And I'm wondering, if you had gone a different way back then, what would we be seeing with uh, an id game where everything was made for Joe Sixpack to mod? Um, how would you go through and build an engine, say, QuakeCraft? So that's, uh, we very consciously thought through these issues on this, and I, it, you know, it's hard to, it comes off as insincere to say, you know, oh, we have all these sympathies for the mod community, but this is what we wound up doing anyways. But we really did agonize a fair amount over the fact that we are cutting off the ability for, you know, the average guy to go make the, you know, make a game, uh, to hack it up and do that. But we felt that the things that were the most critical goals for Rage were that we had to deliver this you know, this standout lush experience. We had to have something that, that was not just passably good. And in fact, at the very beginning of Rage's development, uh, I probably talked at a QuakeCon several years ago about how it looked to me like it was gonna be possible now to put together an engine that was more like RenderMan, where you can just, you can throw as much or as little stuff as you wanted at it, uh, but it would be easy and I, uh, you could take it apart and do anything at any level, and it would be flexible, and it might be a tool that we're using for 10 years into the future. And that was a direction that I actually started on, that we would have this general purpose toolkit, but we came around to, one, performance still matters, and this flexibility cost us in different ways. Uh, and then what we thought we could get by taking the real discrete, discontinu discontinuous step to the mega texture technology was gonna be worth it that it could give us this hope of 60 frames per second and painted worlds. And we knew even back then that, okay, these are gonna be hundreds of gigabytes of stuff going on here. We're probably gonna have server rooms full of things uh, that are required to build this. And it's going to cut out most people. And sometimes there, you know, there are just conflicting, sometimes there are just conflicts in top level goals. And that's, you know, that's I didn't see a way to resolve it. I mean, maybe we have, we'll have things that we can do in the future. It's still somewhat open exactly what the next major technical directions will be, how much, but it seems unlikely that we would step away from throwing massive resources at things because that's something that a, you know, a well-capitalized, successful commercial company, uh, if we can make a better game by throwing millions of dollars of hardware at it, we should because you know our primary job is to make the best game possible for the millions of people that are going to play it. Uh, it's, you know, and in some degrees, it's an unfortunate casualty of that. Uh, I I remain continuously looking for opportunities for things that we can, you know, do to make that more open. I, uh, you know, again, the the source code is something that that we can do here. I. Uh, there will be a lot of people that, that get good use out of it. I'm, I'm almost scared to go back and look through the old code now with my eyes right now about how we should be writing C++ code in different ways. Uh, you know, sometimes I think about it and think, you know, I may be one of the most uh, prolific in some ways open source developers just by having been able to release all the stuff that I've done professionally over the course of 20 years as, you know, as GPL software. Uh, but you know, I don't have a great answer to give as far as the, the mod ability of it. In many ways, I, I think that the, what I would love to do, and I've, of all of these projects, that lots of things I'd love to do, but I still think the mobile devices right now are a wonderful opportunity to do something that could recapture and better the golden age of modding that you should be able to do, like a mobile title that has all of the tie-ins with 
modding and social networks go together naturally. There is, there is a good fit there. There is probably a billion dollar project here for somebody to go and make fortunes on that have the tighter integration of, you know, of game modding, uh, user creation, social networking. There's probably a big idea there. We're probably not going to be the ones that are going to be chasing it up because we've just got, our plates are, are totally full. Next. Hello. Um, one quick question. Uh, with its Software being under the umbrella of Bethesda and Zenimix Media, do you guys feel that you may go public at any time soon? Uh, there's, there's not been one word of it, and if there had been, I wouldn't be able to tell you. So I guess there's a little bit of information by the negative there that you could pull out of that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Uh, not every LAN party across America has the epic pipes of internets that this one does. Uh, with the lack of dedicated servers being seen in the games that are coming out, what do you see the future of LAN parties that are non-QuakeCon looking like? And would you consider de LAN playable dedicated support uh, for Rage? Amen. Thank you. So, uh, Rage, we, have, we actually have marching orders that uh, future games will have dedicated servers. Yeah. And, um, you know, Rage multiplayer was not, uh, you know, that wasn't the core focus of the game. It's fun stuff to, to jump into and play, and everybody should, uh, you know, should uh, put some hands on the game over there with that. But it was not, we were just beating our heads against everything just to get the single player side of the game done with all this. Uh, so it doesn't have dedicated servers now. It's not out of the question that we could make one in the future on the PC. Uh, if, if it turns out there's a large community of Rage, uh, of people that play Rage multiplayer, uh, we'd be thrilled to see that and support it with DLC and, uh, and dedicated servers as a possibility. That's not off the table, but that's not what the shipping project is. Next. All right. So a while back you mentioned um, you really wanted more control over the hardware. And I know it's gotten misquoted and everything, but um, I'm a CUDA developer in the defense mm -hmm. industry, and we do a lot of, well, an OpenCL also, and soon that horrible Microsoft C++ mm -hmm. AMP. Um, but we do a lot of work where we really found we could do so much more than we would have normally done with the GPU and other things. And I was curious about you know, what you see, because everybody seems to say, oh, we support CUDA, and all they have is cloth hanging over there and water yeah. on the floor. But you know, I mean, there's so many things we use to try to take out the, you know, where there's immersion loss, you know, you bend your arm and it inner, you know, it, it cuts it off, you know, it kind yeah. of shows it cut off. But, you know, we, we did some things where, you know, we modeled it as kind of flesh real quick so it would squish a little and the metal would stay there. You know, or you run into a wall and, you know, it seems like you still have a gun, but it doesn't really make sense that you'd mm -hmm. be holding the gun. So, you know, it would actually scrape on the wall and things. Yeah, we do that in other titles. Rage doesn't have. <laughs> right, right. But I'm just saying, um, you know, there's a lot of things that that really opens up that nobody seems to do, and I don't know if that, would that alleviate some of your stress in that area? Okay, um, I, yeah, I spent a while doing OpenCL work uh, this last year, kind of feeling that out, and it was, uh, I had generally positive experience with that where uh, a lot of things are done a lot better in terms of uh, multiple device queues and synchronization primitives and timing, and all of this is just done better. I, I wish OpenGL, instead of being a peer to OpenCL, was actually implemented as a subset inside of OpenCL because you could do better things with that. I agree. <laughs> um, the classic problem that, uh, like the whole physics accelerator stuff and everything uh, with that is that it's hard to make something, well, it's almost impossible to make something meaningful that requires hardware or resources that everyone doesn't have. So you're limited to using it for sort of fluff things, you know, your grass blades and your atmospherics. Yeah. Better deformation on characters on there would be a reasonable thing to have on there. But that does fall into that category of, well, do we want to go take a program, you know, a simulation programmer and, uh, you know, and sit him down and let him spend, it, you know, spend a month or something and maintain this over the course of years? You know, is it really worth it? And it might be. We don't, that's exactly the type of issue that we're feeling out right now where we've got crazy ridiculous amounts of compute power here. We need to figure out where to best deploy them. And there are questions of both uh, you know, effect and also risk. One of the things that's worth uh, discussing a little bit is the, 
Originally for the mega texture generation, it started off software code and then it turned into GPGPU accelerated code on there. And this was initially just when CUDA was embryonic and it was not CUDA code at the time. Uh, it was an unbelievable pain in the ass to keep that supported on there. It was like, okay, render farm 15 is dying for whatever reason, or why do we get stripes on some of these blocks for this one? And I know that would be better if we did it with CUDA or OpenCL now, but one of the things that, that we came to a pretty firm conclusion on was that throwing lots of x86 cores for our back-end work, uh, you, you more than win back what it takes in rack space and cost in programmer hours on there because it, is, it takes more programmer time and it, you know, in a somewhat different class of programmer to do a lot of the, the CUDA OpenCL type work. Um, but the uh, just throwing, it's different when you're talking about your consumer deployment where we do, we are no fans of the cell processor as an architecture on the PS3, but it's there in millions of people's houses. We're gonna do the best we can with it. So if we wind up with uh, tons and tons of, uh, you know, of, uh, of SIMT sorts of processors on there. We will do our best to figure out how we're gonna use it, but I'll be a little bit scared having dozens of different kernels running at the same time. I mean, we have that in our current job system, and it's frightening you know, when we have to deal with concurrency issues and all of this. Is That is not making anyone's lives better. Uh, the bugs are harsher when you wind up having them. Uh, you know, we're just even in the last month finding scary things about uh, the scheduler on the 360 kind of sucks in some ways from a, pr a priority issue, but having certain threads getting starved, other things don't happen. And, uh, these are all challenges, and a lot of it does come down to debugging you know, developer cost. I, if there's anything that we can do on our side, we'd much rather buy racks of servers than uh, have more developers poking at things. So I'm kind of down on, I know it's sweeping the world by storm right now about everything in the supercomputer world is talking GPUs, but I, I am finding much, much larger benefits to lots and lots of multi-core x86 for our offline work. For games, a lot of it's gonna be a matter of seeing what happens with the next console generation. Okay, all right, thanks. Next. Hi, John, my name's Jeff. Handle is year zero from the uh, Nikose V stream. Um, I've heard a lot of talk about uh, the Quake series, possibly going back to the roots of the first game, uh, the atmosphere, the storyline. Mm -hmm. If possible, if the stars aligned, if you got the chance again, would you be interested in working with Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails on sound design? So the, the story with, uh, with Nine Inch Nails on all of this has been convoluted where it worked with us on Quake 1, uh, worked with us a lot on Doom 3, and we ran into horrible legal problems with management at the end where it was an ugly situation where we wound up paying a lot of money and not shipping, not being able to ship a single one uh, bit of the audio that was worked on there. You can get on Google. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it was interesting. We talked about touching base with them about maybe being able to use some of this stuff on Doom 4 that we already paid for and didn't get to use, no. but I don't think that I, that went anywhere, and we're probably still a little gun-shy about just uh, opening that uh, that dialogue again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you've had a new focus on static analysis like const correctness and PVS Studio and mm -hmm. PC Lint. Have you ever considered using annotations like Microsoft's Prefest? Yeah, one of the things I, you know, one of the things that I look at specifically on there is there's a lot of stuff that, that you should be doing with the language directly where uh, obviously const means in, uh, not out. Uh, if you've got that, then by definition, non-const means out. And one of the big things that's sunk in quite recently is how dangerous mutable, or how be much benefit you get by having non-mutable variables. And if you buy into that, then you just say, well, you never use an in-out variable parameter because that's by definition mutable. So if you've got const, it's in. If you don't have const, it's out. And you just don't use mutable. And if you're mutable, basically the, the right uh, language-oriented paradigm is that's an object method then, a non-const object method implies mutation of some data structure there. But I have thought about uh, putting in it, especially for return types, the annotation of like must check, like just recently, and as you get, as I look at more of these things, I find more and more cases where we had a case just in the last week or two where I was like, oh, if that had a must check on out on there, that wouldn't have been an issue. Uh, we would have found that earlier. So I am seeing more and more value in that. There's a danger to, 
Like if I look at the Microsoft headers with all of the annotations of array type ranges, that starts looking like the verbosity might start costing you more, but I would, I would address that by saying, well, you never pass blocks of memory, you always pass a, you know, some range checked pointer on there. I, so, but I, I'm, at this point, I am willing to entertain all sorts of different things adding in that are optional add-ons to the language to increase our safety because I think that we'll write better code for it. I, I really have had somewhat of a uh, conversion experience to the benefits of doing that. And uh, it's almost like talking, a, talking to a foreign culture to the dynamic language people about, I'm like, my God, how can you write a real program where you're just assigning random shit to other shit and expecting it to work? <laughs> I, because you know some of the some of the scary things that we've turned up that like PC Lint turned up uh, on some of them where we have uh, like in the game and you're saying like okay I want you know if Pan's weapon does not equal this then assign this thing and realizing that they're completely disjoint enum types that are just scary and we look at this and going what's going to happen when we change this to be correct you know what's going to break in the game campaign playthrough. Uh, so yeah, I, I've gotten to be a big believer. I mean, I'd program an ADA if I thought it was a credible thing to, uh, to give us tighter static analysis of things, but I do think that we're constrained to see, see family languages for the reality of hiring a large enough development team. Next. Earlier you had mentioned uh, exploring other engine technologies, and I'm curious what you think of voxel engines. So I've written at least three or four voxel ray trace engines over the years. I, I wrote the first, uh, actually it's probably more than that. I, I wrote something after, uh, actually even before Doom. Uh, after Wolfenstein I wrote the first, I, I, I was attempting to use voxel posts for characters to be able to do smooth 360 degree rotations of characters. I almost wound up doing something like that for the Shadowcaster engine for, uh, for Raven. It was published by Origin you know, pre-Doom. Uh, I looked at it again after Quake 2. I had a time where I, uh, I voxelized the entire world and I did a voxel casting into there and I still remember looking at the, the little crashed escape pod uh, corner done all up in voxels looking at that. And uh, I did another little bit of work midway through Rage where I had, you know, my voxelized box room with our uh, mutant dog stuck in there. I... Um, so I look at it a lot because I, I, I think I actually coined the term sparse voxel lock tree as a valid potential data structure for, uh, for doing this infinite geometric detail because that's the obvious thing that we want to do next after texture everything uniquely is you want to have unique geometric detail on everything. And there would be large benefits to doing that. Uh, but the truth is polygons work really quite well for a lot of things. They, they probably they aren't going to be the be all end all, but I don't really think that in the next five years that a uh, a non polygonal uh, structure will be competitive at the highest level. I expect as we look at next gen console and broad enough adoption of PC stuff that there will there will be some novelty games that are all ray traced all, or all voxeled on there. But when you look at the top end AAA titles, I do not expect that transition happening in that time frame. Uh, but I keep looking at it. There's a lot of these things that you know I'll look at every five years on and on. And eventually, you know, like I do think some form of ray tracing of of forward tra or reverse tracing rather than forward rendering will eventually win because there are so many things that just get magically better there. There's so much crap that we deal with in rasterization with. Okay, let's depth fade our at fake our atmospheric stuff, use environment maps, use shadows. And when you just say, uh, well, just trace array, uh, a lot of these problems vanish. But one interesting thing that people say, look, real-time ray tracing on current hardware. And that's one of the things, that was what I did in OpenCL recently. And I did some interesting work with that. But the real truth is you don't just trace one ray and go 60 frames per second. I, you know, to do, to do the things that people want to see out of ray tracing, you're going to need to trace a dozen rays on there. If you want your soft reflections or, I mean, heck, even sharp reflections, if you've got bump mapping on there, not to look like a mess of noise on there, you start needing an order of magnitude more rays than that. And most people still avert their gaze from the whole problem of dynamic geometry. There's, there's some interesting work that goes on with 
very rapid GPU assisted KD tree construction that's starting to look at some of that, but uh, it's still a long ways off. And it's, it's always the problem of fighting against an entrenched incumbent where we're doing polygon, vertex fragment polygon based rasterizers are so far and away the most successful uh, parallel computing architecture ever. It's not even funny. I mean, all the research projects and everything else uh, that just haven't added up to one fraction of the value that we get out of that. And there's a lot of work, lots of smart people, lots of effort, and lots of great results coming out of it. Uh, eventually, ray tracing will win, but it's not clear exactly when it's going to be. Next. Hello, Mr. Carmack, uh, Mr. Neff. I'm from, uh, this is my first QuakeCon. Mm -hmm. from uh, Roanoke, Virginia. Welcome. Um, sorry if I ask you something off topic. Um, mm -hmm. Thought it was kind of cool that you uh, did a project with NASA and uh, that you did the, uh, I think it was the, you did a, I forgot the uh, rocket you designed, but do you have any other future projects in mind or? Uh, so on the rocket side of things, for one thing, I haven't been to my rocket shop in over three months as we've been crunching on Rage. It's like they've crashed two rockets and installed one brand new machine since, I, since I've been able to provide uh, to get over there at all. Um, now we made the interesting thing at Armadillo where we reached a point where uh, we eked out an operating profit in a year uh, from doing contracts with Rocket Racing League and NASA. Uh, and on the one hand, I was like, yay, this is a, an achievement. It's not just you know, draining money out of my bank account. But on the other hand, I looked at it and said, you know, we spent a year and we made, we did some things, we learned some things, but we really didn't make progress around the goal that we wanted to do, which is to eventually be making these you know, human carrying uh, suborbital rockets in the, the moderately near term. So uh, last year, I made the call officially that we're not pursuing any more contract work, that uh, it's going to go back to all the money coming out of my pocket, but we're going to focus on the things that I actually want us to focus on because I don't want to get trapped as being just another small little technology company that does government contracting work. So uh, we have not undertaken any additional NASA contracts after the, the Morpheus Lander work, and uh, we're not, we haven't submitted for any coming up in the next year either. We're going to be flying and probably crashing a bunch of rockets, but working our way up to our operations now are out at Spaceport America, so we're flying in the big open areas heading for space. Mm. Okay, next. Mm. Mm. I have a question about uh, your porting teams that are going on right now. A while no. back when Rage was first announced, like, I don't know, not right when it was announced, like five years ago, you guys are still on the Linux, Macintosh train, all about OpenGL. <laughs> and then pff, around two years ago, you guys started fading out of the Linux scene, heard some bad rumors about how you guys didn't have the support for it. Then earlier this year, while you were on the Doom 4 team, pff, I think it was January, February-ish, they said Linux was dropped and Macintosh wasn't very hopeful. Linux What's has never on? been an official uh, project uh, since Quake 3 on there. So it is true that uh, Zenimax did not have, uh, does not have a Mac strategy or a, as a platform on there. Uh, things are being discussed you know, right now about figuring out what we're going to do on it. But clearly, again, we've had our hands more than full uh, just getting the current set of platforms out. My worry is that it won't be hard for us to get it back up and running on the Mac again. I, you know, the code's portable across all these platforms, but when we had it running, it was a uh, you know, continuous dance with the drivers of, we, we make demands on the graphics subsystem that really no other product does with our texture throughput on this. And I, you know, I have concerns about if we get the project out there, it might not be runnable till the next OS release on fixing things on there. I, there, there's a huge penetration of Macs and uh, iOS especially uh, at id from everybody there. We'd like to support all of that. We did kind of run out of resources on there. And Linux is even further down the totem pole in terms of what, I, you know, what we can support. It is the bigger the projects and the teams get, it is a lot harder for somebody to just go off and say, well, I'll get it compiled up and running and we can drop it on the, uh, drop it on the FTP site. I, you know, those days really aren't here anymore. There's no, there's no mandate against us getting a Linux version done, but I don't think that we've got anybody right now that is willing to spend, you know, the time that they're not at the office 
working on, uh, or not working on the main projects doing the Linux version. It's not out of the question, but it's definitely not scheduled at this point. And it does come down to just, there's lots of things that I'm sympathetic to and supportive of, but it does come down to fundamental limits on resources. Anything that gets done gets done at the expense of something else. And we don't have a whole lot of something else's that we can, uh, we can take people off of. Next. Uh, yeah, I sort of asked the same question last year, but um, there's 550,000 activations a day and also ZeniMax is knocking down every port that you guys make. Are you guys doing any work with Android? Um, there's actually three excellent ports of all the Quake mm -hmm. games and they get shut down every time someone makes one. So we, uh, we actually hired somebody to be our Android guy. We were going to go start doing that. Uh, but then one of the iOS devs decided to go back and get his PhD, and that guy got yanked into the, the iOS team. And it's, again, one of those things. I, we, you know, we had an open rack out to hire people on that. I, Do you feel like the hardware is uh, excelling beyond iOS uh, hardware? Or? I'm still not hearing. Well, I, hardware is, if you, if you total them up for sure. Yeah, I'm not hearing from any software developers that they're actually making more money or even as much money on Android. Uh, technically, there's no reason why this stuff can't be done on there. We have, uh, we actually had uh, Rage, iOS Rage, uh, running on Tegra platforms, and it you know, looks great. It's bulkier because they only had DXT rather than PVRTC at the two-bit on there. Uh, a little bit messier, but it, it's all worked out. It worked, but we were at that situation where uh, we really didn't want to support the going out and being on the marketplace. If somebody, if a vendor wanted to do a pack-in deal with it uh, on a tablet or something, we'd certainly be happy to consider something like that. But until I, we don't have, again, resources at odds and ends where we can just say, well, let's go, we might get something out of that. I'm, so until somebody can basically show us that, look, there's, there's clear business case here, let's take somebody that's doing something else that's making money and put them onto that. Uh, it probably won't happen. The other, I mean, it will undoubtedly happen at some point, but it's not happening right now. We don't have somebody working on it because everybody's working on other things. Uh, the whole mobile platform has been kind of an arc of my random interests in these things. You know, it was like, here's a crappy feature phone, let's go make a game on it. It's like, ooh, iOS is kind of cool, let's make games on this. And it was, I have this little window of 10% of my time that I could go and devote to other things. I downloaded and installed the Android SDK and started bringing it up. And I'm like, okay, Eclipse again. I worked a little bit on this when I was, I, you know, doing some of the uh, the Brew or Java and Brew stuff on that, on the feature phones. But I just didn't have the time there. I was like, just coming out of two months on iOS stuff. I'm like, I poked at this a little bit. It wasn't instantly fun and rewarding to me on there. You know, there's just that it's a different platform. It didn't, it didn't seem to exactly, uh, you know, ring bells correctly for me on that. So I'm like, well, I'll get somebody else looking at this. You know, we worked with NVIDIA on the Tegra stuff there. I am, but it's, I, I have too many other things on my plate for it to be a personal crusade for me. And right now the company still hasn't looked at it as something that's a clear and obvious business case. Well, I look forward to my uh, Doom 3 port probably coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next. Mm -hmm. uh, this question, I guess, uh, coming out of uh, rage and being still in the heart of the, the next project, uh, are there any technology wishes that you have that say, like if uh, NVIDIA and AMD, and, and we'll throw Intel in there too, mm -hmm. uh, had a hardware feature uh, that was supported well and stably across all three uh, graphics vendors, uh, what would that hardware feature look like? It would absolutely be direct memory access to uh, the data sets in there, being able to map all of them and directly poke at them like we do the consoles. That would make a huge difference. Uh, somewhat related to that is the question of virtualization, where ATI new hardware does have page tables and we can do virtual textures. And one of the PC things that I, that I may yet do is I, we have to do various limits because the way we, we break things up into pages, it limits the anisotropic filtering and some of the other stuff that we can do. I, I would like to, on ATI's latest hardware, do it through everything through their virtual system on that. It would be, it's, it's almost certainly too much work to really support on there, but I want to at least take a stab at the, 
Uh, and again, that's kind of my speed of light render of if we did everything right on here and had it all perfect, how much better would it look? Uh, but there, it's, it's a lot of work actually to go deal through all of that because their, their limits are still 32K by 32K textures. So we'd have to chop up our 128K by 128K ones, which would mean adding geometric splits. But it's something we'll probably take some hack stab at. But in terms of whiz bang graphics features, it's been a long time since I've really cared much about that because they're programming targets now and most of the things that we do are in the fragment programs or the vertex programs or geometry programs. And it's like, uh, you know, it's like asking for new features in the C language. You know, there's, yeah, there's reasons why we want C++ OX or whatever, and, but they're not things that you get terribly excited about like, you know, ooh, multi-texturing or <laughs> like we had years past. So uh, it's a similar cycle to, it used to be we were very, very excited about CPU stuff where like, yay, we've got 32-bit addressing, yay, we've got an FPU, or maybe yay, we've got SIMD stuff here. And then after that, it kind of fell off to just don't care about CPUs anymore. They get faster, they run the stuff faster. And GPUs have really taken that same path where we're like, yay, new feature that we can do awesome stuff with. And then we're kind of like at the maybe yay features of some things. And then it's at the, eh, just keep making them faster and we'll keep soaking up the performance. Um, Mr. Carmack, so it's a oh. pleasure being here. I came from Austin, my name is Z. I'm very <laughs> interested in the way you approach the performance because one time I was going through your uh, C code for QuakeG Arena and I've noticed you even optimizing on square root. Yeah, so I realized yeah. probably your code is the fastest in the world. So uh -huh. I, I wanna know how you do it or do you have your own set of so, tools and all the good stuff. That yeah, so please. optimization is, uh, you know, in the terms of things that you do on programming, dealing with the resource constraints is in many cases a fun aspect of it. When you're not absolutely under the gun on it, it's because it's quantifiable. It's very nice that you can measure this and say, well, we went from eight milliseconds to 6.2 milliseconds. Um, and that's, you know, that's good. Most of my work really for, for the very longest time though, I, you know, I, I'm not our, uh, like right now, John Paul is our hardcore low level optimizer that writes all the SIMD code. In this project, I wrote one SIMD function just to you know, refresh my memory, and he promptly rewrote it after I checked it in a little bit while, a little <laughs> okay. while later. Uh, so I'm, I have, I'm the systems level guy. It's figuring out the choices of you know, what we want to do, which decisions are going to make broad or deep impacts, and then you know, pushing them through. And I've missed some of that. Like it was fun on the mobile stuff, write a little bit of ARM assembly language I, because I, I was one of the early people out of assembly language though. In the early x86 days, you know, you write, and certainly even going back further to 6502, uh, I wrote, you know, all the Apple games were in assembly language on there, and I wrote a lot of assembly on uh, early x86 stuff, but uh, there were people that got stuck in that while I was very much like, no, there are real benefits to writing in high level languages, and then there are real benefits to using 32-bit protected mode. We will produce better outputs even if, you would have the people that would look and say, oh, but in protected mode, you've got all these translations and TOBs. You know, if you were in raw mode, you'd, you know, you'd get these cycles back. And a lot of times that level of optimization's not the most important things. And it's, it's fun, it's entertaining to do. And in some cases you go in and you can really make a difference, but uh, it's rare nowadays to find the thing where uh, that particular hyper-optimizing one piece makes a real difference to you when you look over at the whole game playing. There's a bunch of little things there, but the real worry is that um, you trade off a lot of maintainability and uh, the ability to improve things by, code gets rigid and fragile the more optimized it gets. And there are stuff where you look at this and say, ooh, I don't want to even touch this code because it's, it's hyper-tuned, it's very fast, and if you if you touch it, you'll at least make it slower, if not break it in some way that you don't understand. Uh, but again, performance still matters, even today, and we do have code like that. But what's interesting is when you look back a generation later, like one of the first things that we did uh, as we were going into Rage was we ripped out a bunch of uh, like hyper-optimized stencil shadow optimizations from Doom 3. We were like, okay, these don't make any sense anymore. We're taking them all out. 
And there's a lot of code in Rage that I look at, and it's like, how long will it be before all of this stuff looks stupid? Like it was just a ridiculous way of doing things that you go through all of this. But the interesting thing is, I go through it in my mind and say, well, to, to render the game directly without all of this crazy mega texture stuff, uh, we would need a, in most of the levels, a 128K by 128K uh, image that's three DXT channels. So that winds up being uh, 16, 40 gigabytes of video memory. Uh, if you can have 40 gigabytes of texture memory, all the Rage mega texturing stuff goes away and you can do it the dead easy way. You allocate all of that. Might be a little bit of a load time, but by the time we have that, it, uh, you can just load it all in and just bind texture and go on there. So, I. Uh, but programmers have to be aware of, especially systems programmers, have to be careful about focusing on optimizing because there is so much effort that goes into the product and you have to care about it's the end product. Uh, programmers that focus on a routine are probably not, they don't have the big picture and they might be tools that you use. It's like, okay, if you've got your twitchy little bit head that's gonna go spend all his time doing this one stuff, if as long as he doesn't break anything else, that may be valuable on there, but I would much rather have programmers that can look at the entire big picture and can take a, you know, a systems approach to saying, it's like, well, we can make this faster or we can do this so we can only need to do half of these or, you know, questions like that have the higher payoffs. Uh, but it does come back to my, you know, SCA for programmers on there. It's, uh, there's, there is value and entertainment in kind of going back to the roots of getting down to what the machine actually does. And I do think some of the, some of the high level systems decisions that I look at right now, uh, I take the case where we are programming in C++, we're not programming in Java or something, we are dealing with the bits and bytes there, and we should be doing things that have big payoffs from that. One of my big uh, architectural directions going forward is to, uh, is to arrange so that instead of doing loading and serializing and all of this stuff. One of the, the real wins that we've got nowadays, we've got massive multi-core systems, we've got solid state drives, 64-bit addresses, and huge amounts of RAM. Uh, I wanna set everything up so everything lives in memory mapping. And this is like high-level systems optimizing. This isn't saying, let's avoid the load hit store here. This is saying, let's avoid all of our loading process altogether, be able to live with things in the buffer cache, map, a terabyte of data if we need to into the 64-bit space. What systems level things do we have to do to make that possible? One of the things is you can't use virtual functions in objects at all because the V table that at the start of that is gonna break between function invocations. And there's like systems level questions like what do we need to do to set things up to make this possible? It's a grand goal. It would give us two second level loads during development. You know, change something, jump into the game, be there. No, you know, no waiting as things load through this. Uh, you know, once you've kind of gone through your work for a little bit during the day, everything's there, everything's fast, it isolates programs. These are big win items that we get there, but it requires an optimization approach at a systems level. It means re-examining like our fundamental data structures and how we look at that. And I, you know, I do think that those are the kind of the high level optimization things that really matter. But it is fun going in and packing things into cache lines and avoiding the load hit stores and pre-touching and all of that stuff. And it's, uh, you know, it's things that it's quantifiable, you learn by doing, and, it's, uh, and it applies through everything. But it's not as important as it used to be. You know, back in the, in the days of Doom and Quake, so much of the, the magic of the game was in these few little assembly language files that made it run faster. But a few years later, you find out that nobody uses the modex interleave stuff in mods because you just want a linear buffer and time marches on and techniques become you know, less important or they find new niches to be used in. Next one. Uh, hi, my name's Henry. Um, I'm a uh, senior at Missouri State University. Um, I'm in computer science. And before I ask my question, I just want to tell you that I am in computer science today because of you and what it did back in, started back in 1993. Um, you're, you're just one of the living legends that I, I look up to. So my, uh, my question for you is, um, well, I really like how you guys open source your engines, you know, after they sort of had their run. Uh, when I was out in the audience, I heard you mention something about using a proprietary technology for Microsoft for compression, DXT compression, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering how that will factor into your open source release of Rage. 
Uh, there are potential legal minefields with this where with the Doom 3 source that's going to come out, the, as most people know, there's the whole issue of the creative patent on the, the Carmax reverse stencil shadow thing on there. Code's code. Uh, if somebody uses that in, uh, in something, they could theoretically have get a demand letter from creative on there. There's work around. Performance isn't an issue now, so we can go ahead and just render multiple times and work around that, but it is uh, the user's responsibility to see whether they infringe on any patents on there. And I, I don't know what the Microsoft situation would be on there, uh, but of course that's looking a long way. I don't know when the Intech, uh, Intech 5 stuff is going to be open source released. It's, it's certainly my plan of record at some point, but as we look at these things stretching out there, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath. I wouldn't be surprised if I, you know, it could be 10 years. I mean, who knows? It depends a lot on the commercial structure of everything where if we've gone on to something completely different I, and nobody else has anything Tech 5 in development, then I'd push for that earlier. And again, I'm, it's, I, I was pleasantly surprised at how cool Zenimax was about the, this, the fact that I, you know, Prey 2 is still derived off of this source code that we're going to be releasing here shortly. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be marking any dates in the calendar for Tech 5 release. And, uh, and it is possible that, and that is one of the things that's scariest about doing this from making an argument to, to Zenimax on here is that there's the possibility that whenever you release code, I, somebody could go through that and say, this infringes on a patent that we knew nothing about, and there could be a problem with that. And I, I dread the prospect of that happening because if it happens and Zenimax is inconvenienced by any of that, I won't blame them a bit for just saying never again. I wouldn't expect anything else. I mean, they they have no ideological, I, you know, I, horse in this race. I, you know, I and I wouldn't. It, it probably would not be. I. You know, fiscally prudent to their their board of directors and everything. If they if they they're humoring me now, and I I am very happy about that. You know, if John wants to do this, they're gonna they're gonna see that it gets done. But uh, there's gonna be a limit if they ever actually get negatively impacted by that. And I mean the the whole software patents issue is you know is, is a horribly unfortunate thing because everybody is infringing, everybody knows it, and you're just supposed to ignore it. I'm. You know, it happens on the hardware side uh, just as much as the software side. Everybody knows that they're infringing on patents and you just, it's a cost of, it's a parasitic cost of business in most of the, you know, the computer industry. Uh, but I, I do despair a little bit about seeing significant change in it. A couple of things. Um, with your static analysis work that you've done recently, what were, are your, and you may have an answered this in a couple of questions previously, but um, what are your top couple uh, admonitions for writing correct and maintainable code? And then how do you feel about RAII as a uh, games programming practice? Yeah, okay. So uh, the top two issues that, the top two real issues that come up in quantity for us, uh, the number one biggest is uh, printf format specifiers. It is absolutely amazing how many errors we have with that. Uh, and it's, it's a good general, you know, one of the general principles of programming is don't repeat yourself. And format specifiers are something where you have to do something right in two places. They have to match. Uh, but there have been literally hundreds of these things where, uh, where things would just be wrong. An object gets passed in where it's expecting a care pointer. And, and these are crashers that are happening. And they're edge cases where it's something that's like, Print, you know, it lib printf warning, you know, this object is messed up. But instead of printing that, it then crashes on there. So uh, if you're using the Microsoft analysis stuff, you need to actually add these extra annotations to say that this is a var args target on there. But that is critically important. And we have a bunch of these where the argument can be made that the, uh, you know, that IO streams in C++ is, uh, you know, is a better way because it's type safe. And I've come around a lot to a lot of some of the some of the C++ patterns on things as I've I've developed more. Where I sort of backed into C++. I was an Objective C programmer. I you know on Next Step, and so I knew object-oriented programming. I programmed in C all the time, and so okay, C++ is C with classes like this and a few other things. And uh, you know I chuckle now thinking back, and I'm like, 
you know, what do we need these damn references for? Aren't they just pointers? And uh, a lot of things like that that I, I've come to appreciate more of the, the value of things. Like, I wish somebody had made me read, like, I, you know, some of the good C++ books uh, early on rather than just looking at other people's C++ and, and picking it up. But I, uh, so printf format specifiers, number one, a uh, bad thing for us. Uh, but I still haven't come around to I.O. streams on there. I'm not a fan of, of a lot of operator overloading uh, in general. I mean, I could almost be said to be, I've, if it weren't for vectors, I think I would ban uh, operator overloading because I just don't like that a lot. And, and I just find the I.O. stream syntax offensive. But, I, you know, but we catch all these now with the analysis. So the analyzer gets that. Uh, various null pointer problems are the number two problem where, and of course this can't catch everything. It has to, it makes the assumption that if you check somewhere in a function for a value against null, it's, it assumes that maybe it could be null and if you don't check in someplace else, it flags it for you. And that's also hugely valuable. But we also catch just dumb things like an array with two things looking at element three in it and I, you know, stuff that you're just like, how did anybody write this code? Uh, and it happens to everybody. And that's the real thing of internalizing the humility of it. It's not that there, there are good programmers and bad programmers, but the best programmers still make lots of mistakes. Uh, so the, let's see, other things with the static analysis. It's, it's been incredibly valuable uh, in just so many ways. And I recommend that to every programmer. I. Uh, I haven't yet checked, uh, Google has a CPP check, which some people have recommended. I don't know how good that is relative to the, the other tools that we use. The Microsoft tool is super convenient. It's the best thing, to, it's also the fastest of them for what they've got on there. So if you have the, the hyper expensive premium platinum whatever edition, you should be using that on everything. If you're a 360 developer, you should be using it on all of your code. Uh, you know, PVS Studio has a, uh, a free demo option that, it's a, it was actually kind of a clever thing that they did with that where you can download it and use it as a demo version. It reports all the errors, but it only lets you click on like half of them to go to your, so you could painfully use it and go through and look at all their different things, but it makes you say, yeah, I really want to pay them just so that this goes to the right line every time when I click on it. And I, you know, and then we use PC Lint with Visual Lint as a Visual Studio add-in to make it it's sane on there, which is probably also one of the reasons why I didn't buy into it when I, when I looked at it years ago was looking at reams of just output from a tool and then correlating that to your code is, is pretty painful, but having the extra tools that sort and annotate and let you jump to things uh, on there was, you know, does make that much more worthwhile. So big benefits on the static code analysis. It's, I, I, I recommend every programmer use it. Uh, good afternoon. I'm from uh, England. Uh, I'm not a computer programmer. Uh, I'm not a computer expert, but I do enjoy art and uh, video games. And watching that uh, clip, the, you know, the trailer, it was so cinematic. And as a student who enjoys art, that was a work of art. And for me to say that, you know, it was images filled with violence. They were visceral. They were quite shocking and disturbing. Mm -hmm. But they were also quite beautiful. There is beauty in that artwork. And uh, as you said earlier, you could freeze frame any image. It's like a, a work of art in motion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the texture and the substance behind that, I think it's, it's quite awesome. And the level of you know, engineering and work required, I think is quite amazing. A, a human mind can envision such a, a landscape, such a, you know, a, a place where people can immerse and you know, participate. The question that I want to ask is this. In England, there's a great deal of censorship in film and also in computer games. And uh, I'm just wondering, do you anticipate any kind of censorship issues with this uh, game, Rage? So the, the censorship issue, it's bizarre, where we actually passed the German censor board for the first time ever with Rage. <laughs> and I don't understand it. I, I don't, I mean, they, you know, they, 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 can't, uh, they cut Doom 3 and, you know, previous games. And, you know, I mean, we have, I mean, there's, it is interesting about Rage where originally we set out and it was going to be a teen-rated game. We're thinking, it's like, well, it's driving and all this stuff. We can reach a broader audience. And I'm, I'm so happy that 
Uh, ZeniMax actually went out and did uh, market research, and they thought, it's like, well, teen-rated shooters uh, you know, are not respected. You know, we think you should make it an M-rated game. I'm like, okay. Um, so, and it turns out that so many of the best moments in the game are that extra level of it in there where you know you toss a grenade over and somebody lets out a burst of profanity, dart charging away, cartwheeling through the air as the explosion goes off while the jibs of his buddy fly past him. And, and you, you just can't help but, you know, but smile at that. And that's, uh, that's the value that we got out of that. And I don't, know, I don't understand why we, uh, we got through Germany this time without any cuts. But yes, apparently the... Uh, although another bizarre thing that, that happened with, uh, with this is some of the, the bandits actually speak... Uh, they have Russian curse words in there. And the Russian translations came back beeped out. Like, what the heck? Um, so I, I don't know what happened with that either, but apparently also our translations are really good on the product this time, where we've heard a lot of, uh, from the European press that it's, I, you know, that it's actually good. It's not just wooden talking over, I, you know, reading off a script on there. So we should have much better appeal on all that. But apparently the game's going out unmodified across all territories. And as to the, you know, the, the scale and the scope of the artwork on there, that really is some of the high points for me on the projects where it does always turn out better than I can imagine. I mean, I'm not an artist. I can't see that, you know, that level of detail and that vision. And I, you know, and, and I am amazed just over and over again with what we get out of it. And I do, you know, I'm running around obsessing over some texture paging issue, but I just stop, back up, and look around. It's like, man, this looks awesome. This is just fabulous looking. <laughs> And, I, and one of the paths that's, that's been interesting is we brought on a lot of people at I, you know, a, I, you know, very entry level doing the stamping, you know, going through the world, and that has worked out so well where we get scared at the end of touching anything. Do you want to modify a model on this? But because of the way the mega texturing stuff works, they are back there busy just making things more beautiful. They're running around. This area is a little too plain, adding some stamps on here, bringing that in. And it's, it's been great to just have that level. Of, they can just sit there. They can load up any level, drive around a little bit, find something. It's like, I'm going to make this look a little bit better. And we don't have to freak out that some brand new guy is messing with the build or anything on there. That has worked out great. And a lot of them will be... I. You know, that we'll be moving on to other positions, starting modeling on there. And I'm excited to see how that sensibility goes through there, where there are good and bad ways of building things. And we have great strengths in this stamping and mega texture stuff. And as, you know, artists start building worlds that are very, very friendly to this, it's only going to get better, as opposed to building worlds that are glorious, but make all of the programmers get kind of wide-eyed and, uh, and struggle with getting it all actually out onto the project. But yeah, the art, and you know, that was actually my first time seeing the new trailer. I didn't get, uh, I'm not involved with any of that. And I, one of my gripes about the game, and I, again, I, I hesitate a little bit about saying some of this, but our intro video in the game, I don't think is all that good. I kept telling people, our trailers kick way more ass than our intro video in the game. I, and I make my, put on my space geek hat and say, that's not what asteroids and Saturn's rings and lunar impacts and <laughs> atmospheric entry looks like. That's all wrong. <laughs> I, but yeah, I think I, I'm, uh, I had a big smile just watching the trailer on there. I, I think we've, we've done some really spectacular things with the game and I am very proud of the whole team. Hello, Mr. Carmack. My name is David. First of all, I just want to say it's a, a pleasure. I mean, actually, I'm honored to, to be in the same room as you, so thank you. Uh, also, uh, uh, I don't play many 3D games. I'm getting a little older, but uh, I remember my fondest memories of Quake 2. And, and actually, uh, uh, multiplayer, which was my first experience. And it was unbelievable how smooth and fluid, you know, over such a small connection. Uh, a Although the bit. funny thing is, you know, when you get that... Everybody's memory goes back like that. And, you know, I've done this on a few titles where you go back and you actually, like when I went back and looked at Doom when I was doing the iOS stuff, like, my God, these pixels and colors and all of this. But, yeah, the formative experiences that we all remember fondly. But I was really blown away at, uh, like I said, the, the smooth multiplayer experience on a modem. So uh, you're mentioning some, even with the, mo the powerful CPU and GPU hardware we have today, you guys are still making 
you know, conscious uh, uh, decisions on what you can do and how mm -hmm. far you can push it uh, with some of the limitations that exist. So my question is on, on the network side, broadband being everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, is that still a concern for you guys as far as network uh, uh, interoperability? Is that still a challenge? Yeah, so the story Thank of you. networking at ID, I, we, you know, we paid super serious attention for Quake Arena on there where that was our, our most network friendly optimized game. With Doom 3, we took a structure where we were saying, okay, we're focusing on the single player game and we had the technology set up so it kind of made the multiplayer just magically happen, but it didn't do nearly as good of a job at it as the, the separation that we did consciously with Quake 3. Uh, so Rage started off with the inherited stuff from, uh, from Doom 3, but we eventually resegmented and kind of refactored it to have this uh, you know, simulation transport presentation interface, which was basically what Quake 3 had. Uh, it's still not where we, and resources again, it comes back to on a normal place, no problem, but like if you're serving a game with, uh, with six cars or something on there, it becomes a little bit of an issue there, but it's not as big of a problem as, you know, as it could be. The networking has more problems than, it's not so much raw bandwidth, it's things like buffer bloat, jitter, and I, uh, pile up that you can get through things that aren't necessarily your own fault and things that are harder to work around. Uh, but we are actually refocusing a lot of our efforts on the multiplayer now where we have, uh, you know, we started off with some of Rage being done by an external team, but we wound up taking it over internally and we've got the commitment that our internal multiplayer team will be continuous and strengthened and growing over the course of future projects on here. So we are I, you know, we're, we're pretty much reaffirming our intent to do a good job on multiplayer, and obviously the next Doom game, multiplayer uh, is not something that we're gonna scrimp on on that. So speaking of old school and 15 year anniversaries, what do you think of Duke Nukem Forever? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I didn't play it, uh, so I, I can't say. Uh, I, you know, it's, you know, I use it as a cautionary tale where, you know, okay, Rage coming up on seven years here. You know, we don't want to be Duke Nukem forever, and they're not unbounded now, so it's, I, uh, you know, someone will eventually slip further than that, and you don't want to be them. I, uh, you know, we were, you know, we were obviously involved at the very beginning with that. I do still have clear memories of, I, I, you know, the earliest versions of Duke Nukem Forever, where it's in the Quake engine and like picking up bloody body parts with two hand mechanics and stamping on walls and just doing weirdo things in that. I, and I didn't have much tie beyond that other than the fact that I, when, you know, when 3D Realms uh, failed on that, we got some really good developers that <laughs> the people that had stuck through all of that and, uh, and had been crucial in getting all of that together, I, several of them work at id now. Hello, my name is Luis. I'm from Miami, Florida, and um, it's probably a question I've um, I've been uh, meaning to ask for quite a bit, and I'm sure everyone has probably the same question in mind. Uh, what are you uh, permitted to tell us about Doom Four? I, I am amazed that we got this far without this being an issue. I. But the, you know, as everyone figured out, the, you know, the, the word here is that this is the year of rage. We do not want to, uh, you know, have talk of doom overshadowing it. So I really don't have much additional to say about it that I, you know, the technical stuff I've said before in the past that we're, we're aiming for, a, instead of being the 60 hertz that rage is in the single player, it's gonna have a lot more stuff going on. It's gonna be 30 hertz single player but multiplayer, at least as an option at 60 hertz. We want to make sure it scales on the faster PCs to be able to have uh, you know, the full 60 hertz on the single player experience there. Uh, you know, we are looking at uh, what we can do for some up quality options on things on there. Uh, much of the Rage team is going to be migrating over to the Doom team uh, development in the near future where uh, you know, we've still got you know, we're expecting to do a Rage 2, uh, unless Rage flops, which it better not. But, uh, you know, we have so much momentum on that that we, we do want to roll a bunch of the people right on to a Rage 2. But most of the core systems guys, uh, uh, 
like me and John Paul and the other people are, are going to be dedicating our efforts to, uh, to the Doom project on there. And there's, and I, I, really, I really should not go, go much into uh, other stuff about it, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, there's stuff I want to say, but I, like, <laughs> yeah. thank you for the open source, Zenimax. I don't want to piss anyone off right now. <laughs> Two-part question: um, mm -hmm. Will Rage support um, AMD's Affinity, and will at home? What is your own gaming rig that you play on? So, uh, I am hoping that out of the box we don't have any support for uh, like multi-screen, multi-eye, uh, extra displays. That's one of those things that I think there's a decent chance that we'll be able to have patched versions on because I'm actually I uh, one of the things I'm treating myself to after we uh, get Rage out the door is. Some uh, some more forward-looking technology research. You know, I've got the the Kinect SDK. I, I ordered a new head-mounted display, and I I want to start just playing around with some of these things and see what benefits that we do get from going ahead and having whether it's LCD stereoscopic or panoramic multi-screen. I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and spend a bunch of money and buy a bunch of toys and pack Rage to play on all of them and make some judgment about whether I think this is you know, good or bad or worth spending effort on in the future. I, I actually think that there's, I, you know, one of the things I should have touched on in the, in the main talk is that there have been a few things recently that, uh, that have made a little bit of an impression on me, external technology-wise, where I've been saying for a long time that the pixels that we draw on the same monitor and the, the same bits of input will continue making it better and better, but I don't think that's where the next, the breakthroughs are coming. And I do think additional technologies, whether it's an input or display, is where the, the big shifts are gonna come. And there have been some hints of that where, like watching, uh, you know, watching my son play uh, Kinect games on the 360 and having that sense of, you know, wave your arm, the guy on the screen's waving his arm, that there's still this palpable depth connection disconnect between it. You know, you're, you're controlling something on the screen, but with your body, but there's the hint of something really, really cool there. And then like looking at a 3DS and you know, seeing the, the 3D effect when, it, when you're in exactly the right spot for it on there, uh, you know, there's a bit of magic in that also. And, and it does seem that we are, are inching our way closer to, you know, in so many ways we're living in a science fiction world already with our, you know, our touchscreen phones and iPads and uh, sent, you know, vision sensing uh, video game systems and all of this. But the world that we're moving to, of course, is the holodeck. And the technologies are, are starting to be in place there. You know, you look at body tracking with the Kinect on there. I still want my direct laser retinal scanning stuff. I, I mean, sometimes I'm tempted to just say, it's like, you know, I build things on CNC equipment. Maybe I'll just go make one myself. I, you know, get one of these and figure out the refractive optics and I want a 180 degree field of view scanned out like this because we totally have the rendering hardware to do so much of these things now. I, you know, that if we tie them in with super, super accurate, I, you know, tracking, and the tracking is one of these things, like uh, connect tracking, it's, you know, it's cool now, but there's still this lack of, uh, you know, it's sluggish and it, the precision's not all that you'd want. Uh, but the great thing about that is those are technologies which are totally going to scale. Uh, you know, it's camera technology, even if you have extra IR stuff on there and processing, these are all highly consumer, highly parallel devices that are going to be getting better, faster, and cheaper at a rapid, rapid pace. And it will not be long before you set up ad hoc things where you, you know, a couple of people drop their cell phones in random places, they auto calibrate, talk to each other, and give you, you know, very good multi-axis tracking that's as good as anything that we do for high-end uh, motion capture studio stuff. And then throwing that all into something where you can project it into your eye, that is going to be one of those magic moments. And we'll, it won't be a sharp, crisp moment where it happens. It's gonna sneak up on us with things like the Kinect and distributed devices and greater and greater rendering power and better sensor technologies. But it's going to be there and it's, you know, it's totally gonna be happening in you know, the coming decade or two of my career. I mean, I'm excited about this. I'm very looking forward to, uh, to this and I'm thinking that we're probably at a point where I can go out and buy expensive toys and play with it, and in the not too distant future, this stuff can go ahead and become something that is dirt cheap consumer stuff. 
So I, yeah, I'll probably be playing with a lot of different high-end PC stuff in the coming months. Hi, Mr. Carmack. Uh, I'm Damien. You talked to my father earlier. <laughs> Guys talked about some technical mumbo jumbo. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ask a simpler question. Um, I'm sure a lot of us liked uh, Wolfenstein Enemy Territory, and I heard um, there were some rumors that you were gonna bring it to a similar platform like Quake Live, where it'll be brow browser-based. Um, are, do you have any plans for that, or is that just rumors? Okay, that's uh, off the table for now. I, I mean, Quake Live has not been a, a business success. Uh, we, you know, we went into that looking at the in-game advertising, and we built everything up for that. And all of the in-game advertising companies imploded, leaving us with just, uh, you know, just some web advertising on there. So uh, it loses money right now. Uh, we're not going to undertake another project for uh, for that. Uh, but again, the, the source code's out there. People can do whatever they want. That's, that's always my fallback on that. It's like everybody's welcome to go do interesting things with that. And I know that enemy territory did probably have a, uh, you know, a stronger following, especially with uh, some of the team play elements and stuff that, that might have been a better platform for it. But uh, you know, that, uh, that ship has sailed, basically. So that's not likely to be happening not now. I was, I was saddened that we didn't have any takeoff, you know, breakout success with Quake Live on there. But looking at it, it is, it is obvious to look at in retrospect that a game that is so skill dependent and, I, you know, and so intense as Quake 3 isn't going to have the broad appeal of, uh, you know, a game where people can more, you know, hang out with their, uh, you know, their teammates at a slower pace and grind their way to greater abilities. And there's, there's real reasons why the modern games are more popular than this ever, ever became. And we're internalizing some of those lessons as we go forward. So, right, one more. And we're kind of winding down here. People are taking off. Yeah. But this quick question is the end of the space shuttle program came around. You know, a lot of throwbacks to you guys that are doing private industry stuff. Um, experts saying, you know, private space travel is five or ten years out. I mean, what, what's your opinion on it? Well, Elon Musk is, uh, you know, Elon Musk is, uh, is amazing in a lot of ways, what he's done with SpaceX. I, and I think that that's really the, uh, the thing that you bring up. It is, it's stupid and ridiculous to trot out the small uh, suborbital companies. You, you talk about uh, you know, X-Core and Armadillo and even Blue, Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic. Uh, it is nonsensical to talk about them, really even in the same sentence as something like NASA. They are different worlds, different levels, way different orders of magnitude of things that are going on. But uh, SpaceX has gone out and I uh, had built two rockets and flown them and done them with an order of magnitude less resources than NASA cost models would predict was possible on there. Uh, I only worry that they are set up in a somewhat precarious position right now where they're going to crash another big rocket. I, they're, they're bigger, more expensive, they'll have more pyrotechnics, and there will be more senators uh, making issues out of all of this. Then, uh, because, you know, they dropped four in a row on, uh, early on, and, it's, and that was the best thing to do. In fact, I, th I thought that they would have done better if they had been crashing them faster, that uh, rather than doing one a year on there before they finally got one into orbit, uh, they would have been better off uh, throwing them down faster rather than trying to be perfect the next time. Uh, but they are in a position right now where they are really the only option uh, at this point domestically for, for taking stuff to eventually the space station after they get their, uh, the COT stuff all out the door. And they're not yet at a point where we can expect them to be flawless. <laughs> so I am dreading the response that's going to happen when when they do fail again, which they're going to. It's just, it's a question of whether it happens on their next flight or 10 or 20 down the road. It's going to happen. Failures happen. But it's so heavily politicized with the, uh, the domestic constituencies, uh, the people that build, uh, you know, the big domestic. It is, but it is almost a criminal shame that NASA's going to look at building another heavy lift rocket. I am... You know, of all the, the government agencies I can look at and say, you know, space is kind of cool, I kind of like NASA, but it's $14, $18 billion a year, and it, the, we don't get good value out of it. Um, you know, we've had, we have good friends at NASA, we've taken NASA contracts on it, but it's not an organization that I can say that the dollars that I pay in taxes that are going to NASA 
are. They're not opening the space frontier for us. They're, they're doing good science. They're doing uh, some engineering work that we benefit from in a lot of ways. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to waste $100 billion if they go off and make a heavy lift rocket because they're not going to do as good of a job. It'll probably get canceled and descoped later. Uh, one of the interesting things that was, I think, insightful that uh, Stu Witt, one of the, uh, the guy that runs the Mojave Spaceport, and he was asked by some government people, well, why do you think that these suborbital, uh, these commercial companies can do some of these things so much more effectively than NASA? And, you know, as, uh, as a small company, you want to think it's like, oh, we're, we're nimble and smart and creative and we do all of this stuff and, you know, they're old stodgy dinosaurs and... Uh, yeah, there's an aspect to that where you get the old people who don't want to look at something new, but the insightful thing that he said was all of the, the small companies that have achieved things of note have been ones that have had a stable fiscal base to work on. Armadillo has my pocketbook. I will continue writing the checks for a while at least. I, there was never any doubt that, uh, that I was going to pull the plug. I, you know, Virgin has, has uh, Richard Branson, and SpaceX has Elon. Uh, and these were all cases where you've got backing of a millionaire or billionaire or something there. And he contrasted that with the situation with NASA, where every year it's a different budget battle on how things get authorized. And when I thought about it, I, as much as I'd like to think that uh, you know, the small guys are all brilliant, uh, smarter than everybody there, I, there's a lot of truth to that. And that's one of those things that you'll get depressed about if you think about much, where so much of the government is fundamentally, fundamentally inefficient to the point of brokenness in a lot of ways like that. Uh, NASA has a lot of inertia. Uh, by design, NASA was spread out over a large number of politically important congressional districts. You know, when it was set up in the early 60s, it was done by very careful design there, so it's got a lot of support. It's not going to go away. They'll probably build another big rocket. Um, and that's just kind of big forces of history in the, in the nation and the way it goes. But I'm not, you know, I, it was hard for me to even summon up much melancholy about the space shuttle. It's, you know, it's a thing of awe in so many ways. But in, adjusted to today's dollars, we spent like $200 billion on it. And we, you know, we could have flown 10 times as many astronauts uh, or flown 10 times bigger space station if we had done things differently. So I think in many ways it was an engineering project that gave some negative results to some important questions that was kept on life support two decades longer than it should have been. Okay. Hey, Mr. Carmack. I'm Ryan Siebel. I drove down from Calgary, Canada on um, a couple thousand miles. Beat the BYOC in the largest land in the Western mm -hmm. Hemisphere. So thank you very much for putting it on because I know we all appreciate it. Uh, just one question. You got that huge quake sign behind you, and I just couldn't help myself but thinking, uh, I, you know, Doom 3 was a, a huge success, you know, for your company uh, as a single-player game. Multiplayer, obviously, you know, was yeah. more challenging in that respect. But uh, after you're done Rage, I mean, it's coming out in September, and you said the, the group will move on to uh, Doom 3, or Doom 4, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Then uh, will you consider uh, pulling out a Quake 5, and if you did, uh, would it be a single player focus game, you know, much like Doom 4 was, or would you say, okay, we're going to make this happen online, this will be our new arena, or, or would it be a balance of both, do you think? Or? So we do not have, uh, there is no existing uh, team or plan right now for a, a future Quake game. You know, we have to, all of our focus goes on to uh, you know, Doom 4 as the primary focus of the company. We have Rage DLC, Rage 2, uh, mobile efforts, and all of these kind of peripheral things, but uh, if, an, if the next Quake gets done, it's going to be done internally as a big team effort, but it is not slated at this point right now. And, and it's kind of futile to talk about plans like, well, what are we going to do in three, four years in the future? Because things will change. You know, we'll, we will make decisions as we retire the existing projects, but so, no, right now, there's, there's nothing in the works. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Hi there, my name is Mark. Uh, just one question. When you said the um, Quake Live was, from a business perspective, uh, 
not doing so well. I was just wondering, what do you see as the foreseeable future for Quake Live? Just because it's that type of game isn't very common. And like most games are now 60 hertz, they're a lot slower. And mm -hmm. Quake has kind of a cult following that that brought most of these people here. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, we really don't know. It's one of those things that I'm, you know, it's it's not terribly expensive to keep running now. It, it does have, uh, it does have overhead. We have, you know, there's a subscriber base. It doesn't cover the costs right now. I am, but it would be really sad to, to shut it down. So I, you know, we, we really just don't have any you know, bandwidth right now internally to, to focus on it because I still like to think that with the right, uh, the right kind of marketing plan and promotion and, I, uh, you know, way to position the game relative to other things that we could attract uh, enough of a user base to, you know, to make it stable on there. But when we had uh, some people that might have been ready to do that, but we wind up co-opting them for the current AAA titles, you know, when. Marty was working on uh, the Quake Live stuff, and we're like, "No, you need to take over doing all the multiplayer stuff for Rage, which is the the higher, uh, which is more important there." So uh, I don't know what's going to happen. It's it's uh, it's limping along as it is right now. Uh, you know, I think that it's still something that I'm happy to have there. Uh, if anyone wants to go out and convince more people to pay for subscriptions, that would be a helpful thing. <laughs> A two-part question. Yeah. The first part: Are you gonna tell us when you're tired of answering questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like I, if there's. It looks like things are petering out. So if any last stragglers want to get up and I, you know, and get their questions in, I'm fine. I'm just planning on heading back over and watch people play Rage. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, so a couple of days or weeks or whatever, you tweeted about uh, co-tracing pairs of rays for uh, locality benefits, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, was that just a creative exercise? And you know, did you find anything interesting? So I, I, you know, a lot. I actually have enjoyed Twitter in terms of letting like some of my random little thoughts go down. It was like the old days with uh, the dot plan files, where I'd found over the years, I just don't have the time to do real serious writing. There are things that I want to, and I probably will eventually, you know, open up some kind of blog where I can have something when I want to write paragraphs rather than 140 characters on. But I. Lots of times, uh, things are just thinking about. I'll be working on something, and that's that's the way most of my insight to things comes. Is you're working on something, and then something else little clicks. And it's like, well, how does this apply to other pieces of things that I'm working on? And sometimes they're just notes for myself to go back and uh, and look at different things. Where I probably will go in and reinvestigate our software ray tracer for I, uh, you know, for all of our offline stuff because that that still makes. That's one of those things that I go through this battle of temptation all the time where uh, our offline processing is dominated by tracing times and we've got good code, high performance stuff. It's not, um, we can still make it better, but we look at things, do I want to do SIMD packet tracing and stuff on there and make the code ugly and SSE'd and, and I'm not sure about that or the real temptation is, do I want to go back and write CUDA code for all of this? But I'm like, no, no, it, it was such a big win to move away from the GPU stuff, but I get continuously tempted by different tracing architectures and different things like that. And I am always thinking about how the memory architecture of things will impact how we can look at I, you know, CUDA OpenCL style processing potentially for future consumer stuff. I, you know, It's not there to something where uh, Rage will ship on the PC with CUDA transcode support for NVIDIA stuff, but it's obviously a small modular part of the game. But uh, just thinking about all those random little things is what I, you know, what makes up the eventual insights when they do hit. Um, is the uh, editor for Rage available in the build uh, in the expo hall right now? I don't. It depends on which one they brought. The uh, the editor is only available in the X64 version, which is not what we're shipping. Uh, we're we're planning on releasing it after the fact, but we uh, we wind up treating the the Win32 version almost like a console. All the tools are only present in the X64 version. I uh, I don't know what they brought. I uh, somebody can try bringing down the console and typing id studio, but they might get mad at you. <laughs> I'm about to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi again, John. Uh, mm -hmm. Two quick questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, have you gotten to try any of the uh, freeware rocketry simulator Kerbal Space Program? And two, uh, do you mind signing my uh, original copy of Doom 2? 
Yeah, after we finish up here, I'll, I'll sign anything anybody Great. wants Thank here. You. And so, yes, I looked at the website. I didn't actually download and play the Kerbal Space Program, but I, I did peek in on it. Cool. So we got one more. Let's, no. Okay. Um, I'm a console gamer, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> my, my PC sucks. Yeah, I know, right? Um, but the, uh, I caught some of my people on my friends list on Xbox Live playing Quake. Uh, live the other day, and I was wondering how the console release that factored into, you know, did that keep it on live support longer? Where no, now actually, that wasn't Quake Live. The, the Quake the, Arena the on arena Xbox rather, yeah. Live was, uh, it's a different product. Quake Live is the kind of web infrastructure web back-end yeah. game thing that you run on the PC. So those are actually completely separate products. The Quake Arena on Xbox Live was uh, rebuilt from the original Quake 3 mm -hmm. source and ported from there. Uh, because we obviously don't have web browser infrastructure on there. So there's act they're actually not tied together and completely independent. I believe that. So. All right. Thank you all.